father did, and he decided to divide the lands, and he used Brook Avenue as the boundary line. All of the area to the west of Brook Avenue, uh, he said, would go to his son, Louis, the, who became the signer of the Declaration of Independence. To the east of Brook Avenue, it would go to his second wife, who was much younger than he was, Sarah Gouverneur Morris, who was the mother of Gouverneur Morris, the penman of the Constitution. However, once Sarah Gouverneur Morris died, the land was to go to Stats Long Morris, another one of his sons. Well, Stats Long Morris, in the late colonial period, joined the British Army, became an officer, eventually wound up as a general in the British Army. He married the uh, a Dowager Duchess, and by marrying that Dowager Duchess, he, by the way, he became a very distant relation of Lord Byron. But nevertheless, his career was in England, and after the American Revolution, that land over there was about to be confiscated by the state of New York because it was owned by a British general. Well, in comes Governor Morris, whose mother held the land for life, and he purchased the land from his half-brother, Stats Long Morris, before the land could be confiscated, and that land belonged to Governor Morris and his descendants until they began to sell it off. Now, the name of the brook was the Mill Brook. The reason why is that somewhere around here or at 138th Street, the Morris family dammed up the brook and established a mill which they used to grind grain. And they named that, uh, the brook, after the mill, the Mill Brook. And the public housing project that you see across the street is called the Mill Brook Houses because of that. Now, this mill over in this area uh, has uh, some minor place in history. Now, what's today's date? What? June 22nd. Okay, June 22nd. On July 22nd, 1781, all of New York City, Manhattan Island, and what is now the Bronx was held by the British Army with their Hessian allies and Tories, the Americans who supported the British. George Washington, with the Comte de Rochambeau, the head of the French armies, came down from Upper Westchester County with an attempt to take a look at the fortifications of Manhattan Island with a view to eventually attacking the, and attacking New York City. Now, they came down here in force uh, following the Bronx River and then following a road that now no longer exists to this mill because this was where you could cross the brook. Now, as they were making the turn around Hunts Point, and of course these buildings weren't there, you could see the Hunts Point in those days, there was just about over here uh, a fellow by the name of Enos Hobby. Enos Hobby was a Tory from Westchester County. It was a Sunday, and he had one girl on each arm. He had been captured previously, he had been a prisoner of war, and he had been paroled. That is, he had given his word he would no longer fight. Uh, but he was here, and this Tory held area, and he suddenly noticed this huge army coming by on horseback, and he turned to the girls and he said, those don't, don't look like our troops. And suddenly it dawned on him that this was the enemy and he had bred a run. Well, immediately he dropped the girls where, where, he, where they were, and he ran like mad to the vicinity of the Morris Manor House. Now, that's where the Mott Iron Works is today. And uh, there the British had established a ferry between uh, what is now Mott Haven and Harlem in order to get supplies back and forth. And he just happened to get there in time, jumped aboard the ferry, and was ferried across to Harlem absolutely safely. Now, with Washington and Rochambeau were a number of guides, American guides who lived in this area. One of them was a 19-year-old fellow named Andrew Corsa, who had a farm where Fordham University now is. Young fellow, first time out in a military situation, and he was leading George Washington into this area. Well, they got to the rise uh, just over there, and the British ships located in the Harlem River and the East River saw them coming and immediately discerned that this was the enemy, and the cannon on those ships opened up, started firing at them. Of course, uh, Washington and Rochambeau, used to this sort of thing, simply paid no mind to it at all, and simply crossed the stream, crossed the mill. Andrew Corsa, 19 years old, frightened out of his wits, on his horse immediately went to the mill to hide behind it. And he hid behind the mill, and cowering a bit, 
And then suddenly he looked out and he saw that Washington and Rochambeau were still going steadily ahead, giving the fire absolutely no mind. Emboldened by this, he very gingerly took his horse, went out and slowly caught up with Washington and Rochambeau, hoping against hope that they didn't realize that he was absent in that time. He caught up with them, and according to, uh, to Andrew Corsa, very late in life in the 1840s, when he was interviewed, uh, he said that uh, Washington uh, smiled at him, slapped him on the back, and he said, uh, that's all right, uh, you know, and get, encouraged him, and then they went on. But that is an incident that had in the American Revolution that happened here, just about where the Mill Brook is. All right, now we're going to go to 138th Street, over to 3rd Avenue, and then up, uh, up, up to, over to uh, St. Anne's Avenue, and then up St. Anne's Avenue. Okay? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're standing in front of St. Anne's Episcopal Church. This church was erected in 1841. This is the oldest church structure in the Bronx. That doesn't mean it's the oldest church parish. It's the oldest church structure. It was built in 1841 by Gouverneur Morris II and is called St. Anne's. Gouverneur Morris II's mother was Anne Carey Randolph, one of the first families of Virginia. Anne Carey Randolph's brother was the son-in-law of Thomas Jefferson. So there's always a connection somewhere. You know, if you have the old school tie, you can get together. Now, when Gouverneur Morris II built this church, his idea was to take all of the members of the Morris family who had passed away, disinter them from where they were, which would be close to where the Morrisania Manor House was, where the Mott Iron Works are, and reinter them here and also in the graveyard. Ann Carey Randolph, for instance, is buried in one, uh, under one of the aisles inside the church. Lewis Morris, signer of the Declaration of Independence, is buried in the crypt just beneath where I stand, the entrance of which is immediately to this side of the church. Gouverneur Morris, the penman of the Constitution, is buried under that knoll. There is a separate entrance to his tomb. Interestingly enough, uh, Governor Morris Helfenstein, who was a member of the Morris family, once asked that Governor Morris's tomb be opened so that he could take a look at the remains. Jolly thing to do, you must admit, right? Uh, now, Governor Morris, in his lifetime, uh, had lost one of his legs in an accident, and it had been amputated. So he expected to find a one-legged man, and indeed, when they opened it up, there was the skeleton of a one-legged man. The only problem is that there was an extra skull inside the casket as well. And to this day, nobody knows why an extra skull is in Gouverneur Morris's casket, but there it is. Uh, also buried here is uh, Richard H. Morris, who was a mayor of the city of New York. Uh, Commodore Morris, who was a, uh, naval, uh, a, a naval officer during the Civil War, and several other Morrises. There is one person who is also buried in the crypt who is a, not a member of a Morris family who is of note. His name is Richard March Ho, H-O-E, and Ho Avenue in the Bronx is named for him. Richard March Ho was an inventor. He was also one of the vestrymen of this church. Uh, that's why he was buried here. He was involved very much in the printing industry, and he developed and perfected the rotary printing press. Now, if you want to know what the rotary printing press is, pick up a copy of your morning newspaper. It is printed on a rotary printing press. Uh, it is he who made the thick newspaper possible, because until then, all you had was the flatbed uh, press, the Benjamin Franklin type of press, and you could only do four pages and circulate it. With the rotary printing press, you could print hundreds of pages and circulate it, and he is re really responsible from that invention for making the modern newspaper possible. Richard March Ho, H-O-E. So now you know what's new besides Ho, Ho, Ho. Okay. Now, he's not related. He was a vestryman of this church. Uh, in the 1860s, he came up to uh, Hunts Point to live, and this was his, his church. As I said, Ho Avenue in the Bronx is named for him. So not only the famous Morrises are buried here, but also uh, one of the very famous inventors, and rightfully one of the prime inventors in the history of the United States, Richard March Ho, as well.
Okay. Yes. I can't hear you.